On this episode of Magnify, I am sitting down with Pastor David to talk about ridgelines. We'll talk about some examples of these ridgelines and how they are informed and illuminated by God's Word. I'm your host, Aaron Miller, pastor of equipping at Grace Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. Welcome to Magnify. warm in here, isn't it? Not as warm as it has been when this guy has had access to that heater. We came in, what was it, last week? And Cam had cranked the heat. We walked in here and was like, oh, sauna. <sighs> nice kicks. Chucks. Are they? Are they? Yep. They are. Oh, okay. Remember when they used to actually wear those in the NBA? Back in the, what, 70s? Actually, I wore them in junior high. They gave us three pairs of Converse high tops the first day of practice. And when I got to high school, they gave us three pairs of Adidas Superstars. Uh. First day of practice. It was amazing. Adidas was king. Yeah. Back what? 70s? Superstars, yep. And then Nike came to market in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about this. Remember what their mm-hmm. desired state was? Mm-hmm. was? Very simple. Kill Adidas. Uh. And so from the CEO all the way down yeah. to the janitor, that was the motto. What are you here to do? We're here to kill Adidas. And they did because of Michael Jordan. Primarily. Yeah, they didn't kill him. Adidas is still... No, of course not. They made him out to be a foreign company, too. Oh, no. Right. Yeah, Adidas yeah. is German or something like that. Wait a minute. It is actually German, or they made them out to be German? I believe they're they're a foreign company originally. Okay. I thought it was I Swedish. was in Yugoslavia. We went and found the Adidas factory. Didn't have special deals, but they had everything over there. Well, Dave, we're not here to talk about Adidas, though. We're here to talk about something you've mentioned many times from the pulpit, And you've given a lot of illustration around it, but it is worth ingraining it into the nomenclature of our church. Because as you know, Dave, nomenclature (laughs) changes narrative and narrative changes culture. And that's how we do things around here. But we're here to talk about the ridgeline. Yes. And you've you've yes. used it in many different yes. contexts. You've said it in so many different ways. And people don't realize that they're actually thinking about the ridgeline when you say things like, we are here to bear witness to the culture, not wage war or withdraw. That's a ridgeline statement. It certainly is. And the whole idea, if you can picture in your minds as we're speaking, that you are up on top of a mountain ridge, a long one. And you know that the top ridge is very narrow. Mm -hmm. And as you look ahead, you see that the ridgeline path, very narrow, winds, and it goes up, and you have to be very focused to stay on it. So let's take a a simple issue of faith and works. So as you're on the ridgeline looking forward, you also realize there are some drop-offs pretty severe ones on the left and on the right. Mm -hmm. And let's just say the one on the right is faith and the one on the left is works. If you stumble and you fall to the right, you're one of those people who says, it's all of faith. You know, I believe in Jesus. It doesn't really matter if I do the works of faith, if there's transformation in my life, you know, that I stop saying yes to sin and start saying yes to holiness and Mm -hmm. to discipline and denying myself, now that's out the window because I believe. I believed when I was seven and I was baptized and I've got faith. So don't bother me with any oughts. Yeah. If you fall the other way, you fall into works and you become one of those kind of legalists who says, yeah, I know I believed in Jesus, but I've got to put myself on the performance treadmill in order to stay in his good graces. And And I imagine that's where you were. Oh, yeah. That's how I grew up. Right, right. And I didn't have either faith or works. Right. Right. But if you know that the Bible doesn't really excite you and Jesus, yeah, great. But until God opens your eyes to the fact that he's amazing, you think works. I mean, there are all kinds of people in various religions around the world who have fallen off the ridgeline into the, the press, off the precipice of works. And they keep rolling down to the bottom and they're it's not a good thing. So we want to walk the ridge line and realize that the, the faith side and the work side both are pulling on us to keep them in tension, which is what the Bible says, and that right. keeps us 
walking the ridge line. Yeah, it was probably close to 12 to 15 years ago that I, I didn't call it the ridge line, but I realized that a mark of Christian maturity, uh, not that I had achieved this, but I could conceptualize it, a mark of Christian maturity in the work of theology was being biblically balanced. Yeah, I tell my theology students that there's several principles. One of them is the tension mm-hmm. principle. Right. It's all ridgeline yeah, verbiage. And, yeah, and and the Bible is very clear about it. Is God one or is God three? Mm-hmm. Okay, so in the history of study of Jesus Christ, when he came and then the centuries after he had ascended back to glory, the church struggled. Okay, was he really God or was he not? And that had everything to do with the Trinity. If, if he's God, he's part of the Trinity, but there are not three gods. And so what they come up with is this, it's one plus one plus one equals one. Or one times one times one times. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's a ridgeline. Right. And if right. you fall off on either side, you either have some weird name heresies. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like Arianism, yeah. monophysitism, Patroposianism, uh, all these kinds of things. All of them were trying to get clarity on one side or the other. And so you have to be able to handle the, t- the biblical tension. I feel like it is a default of every believer to be one side or another, right? It's not always vicious. They're not trying to be heretical. There's not a desire to get it wrong. But in the maturing process of faith and sanctification, we have to understand that we tend to be one side or another. Things are going to be black or white. And we need to understand that actually the narrative of Scripture holds itself down the center. Right. On many, many, many things. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Helping people navigate kind of that hard-lined black and white way of thinking, shepherding them into ridgeline thinking, has proven to be very, very difficult. Why do you think that is? It's like my wife and I. But Sherilyn is a numbers and words person. I'm a words person. Mm-hmm. So math is not my strong suit. I do it in my head. I do it a different way than other people do. But I couldn't solve for X if my life depended on it. I can't do fractions right now. I couldn't do anything. But my wife has a facility with numbers. Mm-hmm. And I think people who have that mathematic view of life, mm-hmm. there's right and there's wrong. Mm-hmm. Because two plus two is always four, which I agree with, by the way. Sure. Yeah. But in, in philosophy, in theology, in everyday living, things are not so clear. Right. Life is messy. Theology is messy. And so we have to understand the tension that God has built into it. And actually, when you learn to live with tension, what you're learning to live with is the sovereignty of God. Right. You're, you're learning to live that he's God and I'm not And if this is what he has written, Mm -hmm. then I need to find a way to understand it that doesn't bother me, but actually propels me down the ridgeline. But that's another ridgeline. God is sovereign, and yet I have the responsibility and the privilege to work and obey. (laughs) Exactly. That's another ridgeline. On sovereignty, on one hand, uh, you've got people who become fatalists. Mm -hmm. You know, like the old joke about the Calvinist when he fell down the stairs. He goes, wow, I'm glad that's over. Yeah. And on the other end, you have people who think, no, if it's to be, it's up to me, Mm -hmm. even as believers. And again, Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So in other words, run the race as though it's up to you, all the while knowing that it is God in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. What caused you to go from your default, which was, I don't know, was it wage war or withdrawal? Was it a little bit of both Well, in your fundamentalism? Yeah. My upbringing was withdrawal. Okay. Okay. My upbringing was come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Right. You know, my dad and his well-meaning fundamentalist Baptist peers, they were saying, look, the, the culture is so bad, you know, don't have anything to do with it. I couldn't have my unbelieving friends over to my house. Mm-hmm. Okay. I couldn't date anybody who wasn't a solid believer or I wasn't supposed to. Mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot of things that fundamentalism does that tries to rationalize being separate from our neighbors, separate from the culture. Right. You withdraw. Then on the other end, okay, you've got those who get so tired of withdrawing that they actually go to war. Was that ever you? Uh, 
I bet you danced in camps where that were, you were around people that did. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. You go to war with culture, and what you're doing is, in order to make separation rational, yeah. you depict it, and you you can't stand it. And, you know, anybody who's culturally involved, you go, oh, they're in the grips of sin. In my world now, it's mostly about the Christians who have gone to war with political culture. Right. You know, they're calling people names. They're making fun of human beings on the other party. Uh -huh. And I just think that that is just as wrong as withdrawing. What did God use to kind of bring that balance and that tension in your life? And, and like, where about were you in the stage of life? Was it college? Mar I mean, what, what did God use? You know, I, th I think it was when I went away to college, left home. Mm -hmm. God had saved me when I, the day before my 16th birthday. And I began to realize that many things that I had thought about God mm -hmm. weren't true or at least they weren't all true. I didn't grow up hearing about the love of God. I think it's because they didn't want us to think too highly of God, that he would forgive us, which would lead into worldly living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I understand the point, but in college, I was introduced to the teachings of John MacArthur and went to Grace Community for three years. And it was there that we really studied the Bible. And actually, I actually heard about the love of God in a way that surrounded me. It didn't make me sin. That's the fallacy of fundamentalism, that too much freedom leads to sin. No, too much love of God yeah. leads to wanting to be useful to him, to be obedient to him. And that's the years where the obedience option, the book that, you know, what God has for me, obedience is better than anything else I can do. That was a way of looking at holiness and the Christian life, not as a series of oughts that I have to do in order to keep God on my side, but as a series of privileges right. that I get to do because God has chosen to put his spirit within me. But you weren't thinking with the precision that you're thinking now. Oh, no, of course not. Right. I, I remember it was first introduced to me with verbiage as you described to me that three-sided coin. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, you should go ahead and explain that first before we move on. Yeah, well, when I was volunteer chaplain for Pacific Lutheran University football, which is a period of about eight years in my life when I was volunteering, but really became part of almost the coaching staff. And I was dealing with a lot of young men, and many of them came to faith in Christ, and I was, you know, discipling them. It was incredible. It was probably the most useful time I've ever had personally in other men's lives. And the coach, Frosty Westering, who's now in the Hall of Fame, he's also in heaven, which is even better, <laughs> he used to talk about the three-sided coin. You know, at a football game, they flip the coin to see who gets to kick and receive, and, and there's two sides. But he pointed out that, no, there's the edge. Mm -hmm. The edge of the coin, that's where when things are won and lost. If you turn that coin on its edge, you have the ridge line. Right. Hey, everyone. Pastor Jared here. The SCV Spring Special Olympic Games are back. This is such a great opportunity for the Grace family to help hand out water bottles and lunch to the athletes and their families on Saturday, May 18th at Hart High School. Join us as we have this great opportunity to show the love of Christ to those in our community. If you're interested in volunteering or want more details, visit gracebaptist.org outreach. We hope to see you there. You know, we need to give people examples of, of what we mean because they really do know what we're talking about, but maybe they've not thought about it in those terms. But we're talking God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, we're talking faith, we're talking works, we're talking grace and truth, all these tensions yeah. that actually we've been preaching on for years, Yes, but we're just now getting to the point where we realize, I think because the days are darker or they at least feel that way more locally. And we need to help our people think Christianly in the area of politics, when it comes to neighboring and witnessing to our culture, these things we value as a church because the Bible values them. And putting verbiage around it is going to help them know how to maybe approach a relationship or a conversation. And quite honestly, 30 years ago, some of the things going on in society we're closer to the Christian ethic than they are today. And so increasingly there's there's more of a pagan environment and Christians are asking the right question, how then should, should we live in this? Yeah, and I also think, you know, COVID and some other things that have been happening have created a very harmful way of looking at everything in life as either black and white. 
Yeah. There is an intensity now. We want to have clarity. You're either right or you're wrong. If you're wrong, I cancel you. Right. Okay, so we, we've got this split-second judgmental attitude uh, in all kinds of things. Right. Sherilyn and I, you know, sometimes we're trying to find a new television show. Mm. So you go on some of the streaming services, and there's 400 of them. And so you click on one. I can tell you within five minutes whether I'm going to like it, mm-hmm. or I think so, mm-hmm. right? I, that's what I think. Oh, that's trash. Boom. It's gone. And we tend to want to be able to make split-second decisions about things when really we're supposed to live in the tension. I'll give you another one that I think is uh, very important. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, your uh, wives are to submit to the husbands. And if we go, okay, as a husband, I'm going to be a dictator. Okay, you've gone off a deep side of the ridgeline mm-hmm. that isn't good. Right. On the other hand, on the other side is I'm not going to lead. I'm going to be passive. My wife's going to do all the leading and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's just as bad. Right. So what do we do as husbands? We walk the ridgeline as leaders who sacrifice. Right. Leading and sacrificing for the one that you're leading is a ridgeline concept right. that, that our culture doesn't like. Right. Okay. I think, I mean, this is all over the scripture, but one book that stands out in my mind is the Gospel of John. You walk in tension all throughout that gospel. Even in the prologue in chapter one, verses one through 18, John is tapping into the infinite eternal nature of the word that became flesh. And then it comes all the way down to, and he, he put up a tent in your backyard. Right. 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 So, so Jesus is portrayed by John in that gospel as being in many ways, very alien to the context and to the situation. And yet Jesus is very relatable and personable at the same time. And that just flows out of our, our concept of God. God is almighty. Right. He is sovereign. You're right. And he's father. <laughs> yeah. And he's the father who bids us. Right. Come, sit on my lap. Give me your anxieties. There's nothing warm about eternal, you know, yeah. glory, <laughs> transcendent. I'm like, I can't go to that. I can't approach that mountain. Right. Unless he comes to us. <laughs> yeah, and he does. Right. Yeah. And so, again, I want to caution our listeners that we're not trying to make you compromisers. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. It, a ridgeline is not a compromise. It's not a little faith and a little works. It's all of faith that works and works that are produced by faith. For instance, it's not that I don't lead my wife. It's not that I compromise and have a little of this and a little of that. It's the Trinity. It's both and yep. fully taught. And it takes the pull of both sides to keep me upright yep. on the ridgeline. And every ridgeline is informed and illumined by Scripture. Right. And right. that's how we know how to walk it. Yes. So, so what are some other, like, help us understand, if I'm walking like a tightrope, I have that balancing bar. Yeah, right? there you go. What are the balancers? What keeps us on the ridgeline? You, you mentioned this, it was in an elders meeting recently, S- Scripture being the lamp, right? The light that shines light on the path. What are some of the balancers that you identified? Well, let me speak to Scripture sure. first. Sure. And that is the ridgeline is always going to take advantage of all the Scripture that speaks to that issue. Right. Okay, right. if you start with faith and works as an example again, if you just go to Philippians 2, 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, there it is up to me. Mm-hmm. No, whatever we're going to be dogmatic about, whatever we're going to be biblical about must take into consideration all applicable biblical texts. That means that we can't just find one we like and, you know, use it as a label. Right. So that's the, the first thing is scripture. And I think that's the biggest one. Right. I think it's also has to do with demeanor. What do you mean okay, by that? Take the war and withdrawal thing. Okay. Some of that is based on what makes you comfortable. There are some people like Aaron Miller, who once told me that everything could be used as a weapon. It's true. Without the spirit of God, you would be at war, really with at war and at war with your neighbors. That's okay? also true. Your, yes. temp- your temperament is towards action that is strong and courageous. On the other hand, there are guys who are somewhat passive. They withdraw from things. They withdraw from situations that they should be more courageous and get in. So we have to be careful that our demeanor doesn't push us to take up one side or the other. Correct. One of the things that's on my mind a lot is what our demeanor should be. 
Mm. And you go to the scriptures and you'll find all kinds of places. The, the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, right. patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Well, that's one side. On the other side, then you've got stand, fight like men, right, be right. a man. Warfare language. Right, yeah. yeah right. And so your demeanor is going to cause you to go one way or the other. So we have to take all the scripture. I guess one of my main mantras right now, or rants, I guess is a better word, is you've heard me say it a million times, live for Christ with a smile on your face. Mm-hmm. Be the kind of guy who can listen. Mm-hmm. Be the kind of guy, Titus uh, 3, 1 and 2, uh, teach them to be gentle, mm-hmm. to be submissive to the governing authorities, to treat everyone with courtesy, everyone with courtesy. Mm-hmm. You know, then some guys are like, oh, well, Jesus went on and into the temple and overthrew the money changers. Let's be real slow to compare ourselves exactly. to what Jesus Because exactly. he's the only one who's walked the ridge line perfectly. So. Yeah. yeah, and he's the only one who has divine wrath. <laughs> yeah. And so we've got to be better as Christians. As I've said before too many times, people who are wondering if they want to follow our Lord are going to look at us and say, if I follow his Lord, I'll probably have his personality. I'll have his demeanor. Yeah. And if he's mad about everything, sad about everything, all he ever sees is what's wrong. If he's swimming in the current of our culture that is all cynicism and criticism and canceling, yeah. they already have that. Yeah. So you also mentioned, though, scripture is guiding the way. Yep. Your demeanor is your core attitude. But on the wings, you also mentioned relationship and situation. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you for reminding me what I think, Aaron. Sometimes, <laughs> David, it... <laughs> half of what I do on this podcast is quote you to you and see if it catches. Well, this had everything to do with the uh, kerfuffle that came up around Alistair Begg mm-hmm. and his advice. In those situations, number one, you want to ask, what does the Bible say? Okay, mm-hmm. so what, what does the Bible say about our association with unbelievers? I would suggest that 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and following is a foundational piece of advice from the apostle to some people living in a sexually immoral culture that makes ours look like kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Uh, Secondly, there's got to be a situational thing. There was a situation that Alistair spoke to that I doubt anyone, hardly anyone listening to us is ever going to actually have in their own life. Where a grandmother has a granddaughter that she has relationship with, that she loves, who's made some really unhealthy and immoral life choices. When you get the situation, you got to look at it that way. And then you got to ask yourself, okay, let's go to the relational aspect. Does this grandmother have a relationship with this granddaughter? Mm -hmm. Has she made her position known? And yet her granddaughter is still inviting her Mm-hmm. And so, in essence, I would go along with Alistair mm-hmm. and say, look, in that situation, given 1 Corinthians 5 that says we can associate with the sexually immoral, mm-hmm. then relationship-wise, the grandmother goes to the granddaughter and says, honey, you know what? Your worldview is allowing you to make some choices that you think are going to help you thrive. Right. My worldview, as you know, is in conflict with that. And I think the choices you're making are ultimately not going to deliver on the promises they're making. And I'm going to go to your wedding, not because I approve of your choices, but because I love you. Now, see, that's a relational and a situational thing that is within the realm of biblical orthodoxy. Now, the other thing is, (laughs) how many times are we ever going to be confronted with that, you and me or any of us? It's minuscule. Sure. However, my point earlier is the days are getting darker. Right. At least in our immediate context. And so that's going to happen more and more and more. That's a good example of do we withdraw from the current erosion of moral ethics Mm -hmm. to the place where we start, you know, we're going to move, we're going to build a compound, it's going to be you and me and, you know, a few more. Right. Or do we go to war with it and, you know, make signs and slogans that say these people are of the devil, they're evil, they're whatever. I think it's real political real quick. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell you what, that's the easiest thing. Those two things. Interesting. What do you mean? To withdraw is easy. Yeah. To know, okay, there's a a gay couple living on the end of our block, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just never going to go over there. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to talk to them when we're putting our garbage cans out. Mm -hmm. This is just an illustration. That's just withdrawing. Or there's the war. 
where when I see them, I'm going to go, you know, I don't think you people should be living this way. You're the reason our society is going downhill. I just want you to know that you need to stay away from my kids. You need to go into war with them. Well, all that does is solidify in their minds sure. that they have the right opinion of a Christ follower. So then what's the ridge line of witnessing in that example? Well, number one, we, we realize they're made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. If we use the Imago Dei argument as a reason to be against abortion, then we can't switch and say when that baby grows up and chooses a lifestyle that is immoral, that we no longer say, well, they're, they're made in the image of God and I have what they need, and God has divinely, sovereignly put me in a neighborhood with those two men or two women. So what we first do is, you know, what does it mean to love your neighbor when your neighbor's uh, sexually immoral? Right. I I would say you say hi to him. You ask him, hey, what do you do for a living? And then somehow you let him know, well, I'm I'm a Christ follower, but you know what? I want you to understand that I understand your ideology and mine conflict, but we can be neighbors. Have them over for a meal. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Genuine movements in their direction. Folks, we're actually going to prepare a summer series on this very issue of a ridgeline. We're calling it the ridgeline series. David, you want to give a little bit of a preview and how you're going to kick that off? I don't know if you've put that into any form yet, but... Well, I think the the first couple of weeks of June will explain probably using the faith and works idea as a model of what it really means to walk a ridgeline, that it has to do with, you know, the Bible, it has to do with relationship, it has to do with situation. Conscience. But it also has to do with conscience and the brotherhood. Mm. You know, the church has to be involved in this. One of the things that walking the ridgeline will do will cause people who have fallen off to one side or the other to cast stones at you. Right. Uh, What I just said about Alistair is a huge example. He made a suggestion, some advice in a one situation where there was deep relationship and he has been canceled all over the place. Well, if you're going to walk the ridgeline, we have to realize that there's tension Mm -hmm. and some things are not black and white. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Some things are not black and white. So we're going to take the first two weeks to try and explain Romans 14, 4. Mm-hmm. One man thinks one day is above the other. Another man thinks they're all the same. Paul says, let each man be convinced in his own conscience. And there, there are certain ridgelines that are absolutely absolute. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah, sure. Faith and works, the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, sovereignty and, and responsibility. Right. But there are other things where the ridgeline is going to be a matter of conscience depending on the situation and the relationship. Right. So we have the scripture that guides us. Yes. We have our conscience, which is kind of our ballasting point. And then you have the situation and the relationship that kind of keeps us yeah. centered. Right. right? And right. so we're going to be helping our people think through every ridgeline. You carry these principles into it. And the goal in, in consideration is remaining balanced. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not allowing bias, not allowing fear of man and tribalism to dictate how we stay on the, on the ridgeline, but allowing what we just pointed out, the guidance of the scriptures, which is our authority, the balance of our conscience, because we, we can't, we can't disobey our conscience, but it must be washed and built up by the word and then balanced by the situation and the relationship that God has placed us in. Right. And we're also going to talk about the fact that some issues don't have a ridgeline. That it's a flat space, right? And there's a there's a huge area for conscience. For instance, what kind of movie should I go see? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay? I can't make a standard for you. Right. Your conscience has to. Right. Others may, I may not. Right. And that's where legalism comes right. in, and we'll be, we'll be exploring. We can that be a personal well. legalist. We can't be a corporate legalist. Yeah. Right? We can understand where we're weak and where we're susceptible, and we have to do the work to exactly. guard us inside Christ. Yeah. Dave, thanks for sitting down on this one. Uh, this is going to be great, and it's going to be really hard. Yeah. And we need our people to come not with a magnifying glass trying to find something that's wrong, but trying to find something that will help us all walk the ridge line. Yeah. I, yeah. It's going to be good for our people. I'm looking I forward to it. Okay, folks, thanks so much for streaming in. Hopefully you're able to join us next time for another episode of Magnify. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to Magnify Podcast so you never miss an episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others. Post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask in our mailbag, you can email them to magnify at gracebaptist.org and we will answer them on the show. 
Thank you so much for streaming.